Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So in the second lecture on uh, the topic of uh, gene libraries and their construction, uh, we now will discuss what are cDNA libraries. So in the previous lecture, we talked about genomic DNA libraries where you uh, isolate the entire genomic DNA of an organism, fragment it and then clone it into vectors and transform E. coli. And uh, so a collection of all those clones will represent the entire genome of the organism and that is the genomic DNA library. Now in this lecture we will talk about what are cDNA library and um, first of all why do we create a cDNA library in the first place. Now we know that uh, when you take the genomic DNA of any organism uh, then other than the genes which are transcribed, uh, a lot of uh, genome is uh, basically concerned with the regulatory sequences and those regulatory sequences may not be essentially the one which are transcribed regions of the genome. In eukaryotic genomes, we know that there are introns present within the genes and those introns have to be subsequently removed in order to uh, get the final transcript. So if you are not interested in the non-coding part of the genome uh, and you only want to study that part of the genome which is actually transcribed, then you have to uh, basically construct a cDNA library and in most cases the cDNA libraries are called the expression libraries because uh, very frequently these libraries are created in order to study the gene expression or the that part of the genome which is expressed in the form of proteins. So if gene expression has to be studied then genomic library may not be very informative and also you do not need to create a genomic library because it is not going to tell whether a particular gene is expressed in that particular cell type or tissue or not or that organism. Right? So, for example, you may be interested in studying uh, the gene expression profile in response to a particular treatment that you may have given to the organism or the cell culture or you may want to study the changes in the gene expression during developmental stages or during in response to certain signals that are received by the uh, organism or the cells. And therefore, for all these different type of questions, if you want to do a genome-wide study, then you need to create the cDNA library. Because we know that there are certain limitations of the genomic DNA library, right? First is that if you are creating a library for the eukaryotic uh, genome, then eukaryotic genes are very long because they have the non-coding sequences in between the exons which are the coding regions. So these non-coding sequences are the introns and each gene may have multiple introns and uh, because of that these eukaryotic genes they are very very long and therefore these are difficult to clone the full length gene and uh, for each gene to be represented in a single clone or just a couple of clones. Secondly, even if you are able to clone the entire eukaryotic gene uh, in a single vector and put it into E. coli, the E. coli cells, they cannot splice out the introns from eukaryotic genes because they simply do not have the machinery, the genetic machinery which is required in order to splice out the genes, introns. So 
second uh, reason is that uh, if you have put the entire genomic region from a eukaryotic cell uh, where there is a full gene available and then it has come along with its regulatory promoter and everything then those eukaryotic promoters they will not function in the E. coli cells so basically if you first of all clone try to clone full length gene eukaryotic gene in E. coli it is very difficult even if you somehow can clone those genes in E. coli, uh, the introns are present which cannot be spliced out and the promoters of eukaryotic genes will not work in E. coli. So essentially because of these two reasons, uh, the eukaryotic genes will not be expressed in E. coli and there won't be any RNA or protein formed from these genes in E. coli. But of course, we know that uh, E. coli is used for heterologous gene expression. And so what are the tricks that are required in order to uh, express heterologous proteins in E. coli? Is that first of all, you uh, when you clone the eukaryotic genes, you use a, a fragment which does not have any introns. So this can only be done by isolating the RNA which is a mature RNA from which the introns have been removed and then convert it into cDNA and then clone the cDNA. Secondly, you clone these genes into E. coli expression vectors and not the cloning vectors so that these expression vectors, they will have a promoter that functions in E. coli. So now, if you put a eukaryotic gene, uh, with, without any introns and you clone in an expression vector then they will be controlled by the promoter which is present in this E. coli expression vector and therefore the protein can be expressed in the E. coli. So starting point for creating the cDNA library is obviously RNA. Now although most of the time the cDNA library is used for expression studies. The cDNA libraries can also be used for studying other different types of RNA and uh, therefore the depending on the experimental goal uh, the RNA that you isolate can include either the total RNA or polyatailed mRNA uh, which is definitely required for creation of uh, you know expression libraries if you are very interested in looking at the protein expression and what are the genes that are actually expressed not only that is there uh, to what extent various genes are expressed uh, can be done by cDNA libraries but also people uh, make uh, a library of non-coding RNAs or in vitro transcribed RNAs to answer various types of uh, questions regarding the function of these different RNAs which do not code for proteins. So obviously then uh, the purification strategy for RNA will depend on which type of RNA is actually needed. You can of course uh, isolate the total RNA uh, using a standard protocol but then you have to uh, see whether you you are really interested only in mRNA so then you will have to fractionate the mRNA out of the total RNA if you are interested in non-coding RNAs then you have to use a different strategy in order to remove the rest of the RNAs from the RNA sample but uh, uh, we will not talk about the rest of them but most frequently because the cDNA libraries are made from mRNA will focus our discussion only on mRNA. So we know that uh, when you isolate the total RNA, then the most abundant RNA population is that of ribosomal RNA molecules. So the almost 80 to 90 percent of total RNA is uh, due to ribosomal RNA and therefore uh, removal of those RNA molecules is a major concern when you are isolating the, uh, trying to isolate and purify the mRNA. And the easiest and most uh, commonly used 
technique for isolation of mRNA is to use a poly A tailed, uh, I mean, a, a oligo DT column to capture the poly A tailed mRNA. So you uh, have oligo DT uh, and you, which is bound to a certain beads. You pack those beads in a small column and pass your total RNA uh, from that. And uh, the mRNAs uh, from eukaryotes, they contain a 3 prime and a poly A tail. So that will hybridize with the oligo DT column and the rest of the RNAs will flow through and you can wash and then elute this poly A tailed mRNA from the column and use that. So the <coughs> limitation of this method is that this method does not work, the oligo DT method of purification of mRNA does not work very well with the bacterial transcripts because bacterial transcripts have very short poly A tail or no tail so uh, it doesn't bind well to the oligo DT column uh, and even some eukaryotic transcripts uh, do not have a well defined poly A tail. So those you uh, when you use this method then uh, one has to be aware that some transcripts may be lost because they do not have the poly A tail. Also because uh, the method depends on binding of the poly A tail to oligo DT column, it introduces a certain bias in the coverage of the sequence because of this preferential binding to um, poly A tail or A rich region. So uh, the sequences which are more uh, rich in uh, A nucleotide are going to be enriched and that uh, certain bias can be introduced in the kind of transcripts that you see in your cDNA library. Additionally, uh, many times the cDNA uh, libraries are made from samples that have been formalin fixed and paraffin embedded. So when you do a biopsy for example for um, cancer, then the biopsy tissue is fixed in formalin and then it is embedded in paraffin block and then very thin sections are made out of those blocks. So when you, uh, if this formalin fix, uh, fixing of the tissue is not done properly and uh, then the RNA because it is so fragile, it, uh, it is a very labile molecule, uh, then RNA gets degraded. And uh, very often to isolate a full length cDNA from formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues is quite a challenge because all you get are fragmented and degraded RNA molecules. And therefore, uh, when you prepare the cDNA from these or the RNA from these, basically uh, the RNA is enriched in mostly the three prime end of the transcripts and getting the complete full length cDNA uh, may be very, very challenging or you may not be able to obtain those uh, uh, full length transcripts from such samples. Also the cDNA expression libraries are sometimes created for from very small amounts of uh, samples and therefore very small amount of RNA is available to make the cDNA. RNA as you know uh, purification of RNA is very difficult because when everything has to be free of the enzymes which can degrade the RNA and there are many, these enzymes are almost everywhere even our hands our skin has some RNA's enzyme so uh, one has to be very very careful and you have to treat everything all the glassware all the reagents the water in the buffers everything has to be treated uh, in order to uh, there is a compound called DEPC that is used to uh, remove all the RNA's activity from everything. So first of all isolation of RNA is uh, very uh, difficult to get full length RNA which is not degraded is difficult and secondly sometimes the sample may be very very limiting and so very small amount of RNA uh, is available. Uh, 
uh, that can be extracted and then converted into cDNA. So because of this, the um, creation of cDNA library is much more difficult, although the cDNA library is much smaller compared to the genomic DNA library because it represents only the trans transcribed region of the genome. So, uh, as I said that uh, the, some samples may be difficult uh, to get the full length cDNA from and also uh, when the RNA sample is very limited or in small quantities then um, they even might be incomplete removal of ribosomal RNA because your, the RNA of your interest may be present in much smaller quantities in already limited sample quantities. But having said that, uh, even if uh, you are able to obtain good quality RNA and then prepare the cDNA, then there are many, many more steps uh, and there are many ways in which cDNA libraries can be made. But I will just show you one of the very basic uh, uh, flow through of how the cDNA libraries are constructed. So let's go step by step. <clears throat> the first step is to isolate the RNA on an oligo DT column and uh, then second step is that the RNA uh, and create the cDNA. So now you have the cDNA uh, which has been shown in green here because this is RNA with a poly A tail. It is bound to oligo DT and therefore now you have this um, cDNA. Then the RNA can be removed either with an alkali or using an RNA's degrading enzyme. So now you end up with only this first strand of the cDNA. And this first strand then can be, uh, one can append a poly DG tail to the three prime end of this uh, first strand of the cDNA. And then this can be hybridized to an oligo DC primer and now this primer is going from 5 prime to 3 prime it binds to this first strand of DNA and <clears throat> then if you add the polymerase then it can synthesize the complementary second strand of the cDNA <coughs> excuse me <coughs> so now you have a double stranded cDNA um, from so basically because it's all a collection of all the RNAs that you are purifying now you end up with a collection of all the cDNAs uh, double stranded cDNAs from the entire genome uh, that you have. Now uh, one may want to protect the cDNA uh, by methylation of the cDNA so that uh, whenever if you use a certain restriction enzymes to cut the DNA for final cloning then those restriction enzymes should not cut within the gene the uh, cDNA of your interest. So one can do a methylation reaction um, and then people like to uh, link certain adapters to this double stranded methylated cDNA. So in this example, eco, eco R1 linker is used. So it has certain uh, sequences, for example, AT, AT, AT and so on. And then you put in between this linker a eco R1 side GAA double TC. And one can ligate these linkers to this double stranded cDNAs. So now on both sides you have eco R1. One can also use different linkers to be appended to different uh, sites uh, of the cDNA. Now on both sides you have the uh, eco R1 linker which is put on all the collection of the cDNAs that you have. Now you digest uh, with eco R1 so then you will create a sticky end at both ends of these cDNAs. Now you ligate these sticky ends to lambda phage vectors which have these eco R1 sites 
and you package those lambda phage vectors in vitro and then you infect the E. coli cells. And now you will get individual plaques that will be present as I discussed in the last lecture. So there are many plaques that will be present on these plates. So in reality it is not just one plate but there will be a number of plates depending on the size of the uh, genomic size of the organism from which you have started from. So now you have this uh, cDNA library, uh, essentially in a single test tube you have all the cDNAs that you have generated from all the mRNA fraction that you had isolated from the organism. And so this collection of all these cDNAs creates the cDNA library. All right. <coughs> So now, uh, the cDNA, uh, what are the considerations when you generate a cDNA library? What are the kind of enzymes that you use? So as we know that uh, to make a complementary copy of uh, the RNA that you've isolated, uh, one uses the enzyme reverse transcriptase. And this reverse transcriptase enzymes, they are uh, isolated from retroviruses and many such enzymes are nowadays available commercially. So you can just buy it from various companies. And because they are um, uh, derived from retroviral uh, sources, uh, some of these examples are given here. So Maloney murine leukemia virus, uh, MULV or MMLV is a very common uh, RT that is used for making cDNA. Another one is avian myo myeloblastosis virus, uh, AMV. Uh, so these two uh, RTs isolated from these two viruses are commercially available. Now the original RTs they have certain um, limitations and uh, so the commercial companies they have done a lot of research and they have modified these uh, RTs uh, to increase the processivity so that more, uh, much longer polymerization reaction can be done and therefore the possibility of achieving full length cDNA is increased. Also, uh, there might be regions uh, in the transcripts which are GC rich regions and uh, many of these RTs, they are not uh, very good at, um, you know, amplifying those GCLH regions. So a lot of research has gone into increasing the thermostability of these um, RTs so that this reaction can be done at a much higher temperature to resolve these GCLH regions so that they melt and uh, the enzyme can polymerize that. So thermostability has been improved so that the reverse transcription of GCRH regions uh, can be carried out uh, uh, in a much better fashion. And also uh, some of these RT enzymes can also have RNA's H activity uh, that can create NICs into the uh, RNA uh, so that without using any extra primer the second strand of the cDNA can be prepared by using DNA polymerase uh, activity. But uh, having said that the RTs uh, still have certain limitations. First of all the reverse transcriptase enzymes uh, they do not have any proofreading uh, activity. Because of that uh, artifacts can be introduced into cDNA and uh, which may not be actually present in the original RNA. Uh, and this error rate can be quite significant depending on the kind of RT enzyme that one is using and can be anywhere between 1 in 9000 to 1 in 30,000. So for smaller uh, gene uh, transcripts, uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> you will get uh, cDNA without uh, many errors, but if you are looking at much longer transcripts, then the possibility of having some error uh, introduced during cDNA preparation cannot be discounted. And uh, this uh, probability is uh, dealt with uh, by 
sequencing multiple clones and multiple plaques in order to make sure which one might be the correct sequence. And other than that, several other artifacts can be introduced in the cDNA using this reverse transcriptase enzyme as is shown in the next slide. <coughs> so the first uh, problem that I talked about is that if there are many GCRH regions or the transcripts have a lot of secondary structure uh, because of um, you know intrastrand annealing of certain sequences together then the reverse transcriptase may not be able to resolve these secondary structures uh, and it may just stop here or it may just fall off uh, it cannot go beyond a certain length and therefore because of limited processivity of the enzyme and therefore uh, you may not get complete cDNA molecules. Uh, secondly, sometimes these RT enzymes they create a hairpin loop at the end of the um, you know, when they reach the end uh, and while they are making the cDNA on this RNA transcript, they may make a hairpin loop and start in the reverse direction. Or they may uh, bind at multiple places and they can initiate polymerization from multiple places within um, <clears throat> the cDNA and therefore they can create these other fragments uh, starting from the um, first strand of cDNA that has been generated. So uh, this problem that they can sometimes make here in loops has been actually uh, used beneficially to create the second strand of the uh, cDNA by many researchers. The third kind of problem that is often seen is that uh, while uh, polymerizing the reverse transcribing this reverse transcripted enzyme may skip certain regions of the transcript and then start from another region of the transcript and generate an artificial uh, transcript which does not really represent the full length of the transcript. So this template switching is the third problem. So unprocessive first strand synthesis, spurious second strand synthesis, template switching and then the last one is the terminal transferase activity where after uh, making the first strand of the cDNA from an RNA transcript it can use add extra nucleotides at the end. <coughs> now uh, it is uh, useful also because uh, you can create the second strand of the cDNA and use this blunt ended molecule for cloning. But if you clone it in an expression vector and you are interested in generating the protein, then addition of extra nucleotides depending on how many nucleotides have been added terminally to the cDNA can result in the change of the reading frame of the cDNA and because the proteins they are transcribed according to the open reading frame if your open reading frame shifts then you may not be able to get the protein expression of your interest. So these are some of the problems with issues with the reverse transcriptases. Some of them have been uh, adapted to be used uh, beneficially but some of the others they remain uh, a, a slight limitation of this reverse transcriptases and there are many different protocols that people have developed over uh, time in order to deal with each one of these limitations and how to counter and make better cDNA library. So you should be aware that these cDNA libraries when you make it is not really an easy task and you may have to modify many different steps uh, in order to create a good quality cDNA library. So when you're making these libraries of course depending on how you clone the cDNA you can either make a random cDNA library which is basically randomly oriented and so cannot really 
uh, you know, not all the cDNAs will be expressing if you've flown in an expression vector. Or they can be orientation specific libraries. So as the name suggests, the random cDNA libraries, uh, it of course uses oligodt as a primer. <coughs> and once you've generated the cDNA, uh, uh, you can blunt clone them or use a single site for cloning uh, into a lambda gt10 vector or lambda gt11 as cloning vectors. And because a single site has been used for cloning uh, or the blunt end cloning has been done, these cDNAs, these are cloned in a random manner. So some of them will be in the sense orientation, some of them will be in the antisense orientation. And uh, so these libraries, they can be screened uh, by using a DNA or an RNA probe but uh, antibody screening if you want to do antibody screening for these random cDNA libraries then it can be done only for the lambda gt11 library uh, which in which because lambda gt11 is an expression vector it has a promoter and it also has blue white screening uh, you can uh, use this antibody screening only for uh, those clones that have been cloned in the lambda gt11 vectors. However, if it is a randomly cloned library, that even if you use lambda gt11 library, there are only 50% chances of finding a positive clone because by using antibody screening, because 50% uh, of the clones will not be expressing the protein due to uh, their being in the antisense uh, direction. So because of this, uh, people do prefer to use uh, orientation specific library. And as the name suggests, in this case, <coughs> the primer adapter, uh, which is used to synthesize the first strand of uh, DNA, uh, which is used. So the along with the uh, oligodt primer you also introduce an adapter it is coupled to an adapter which has a cloning site which is different from the other adapter that you will link uh, later on in the step so you can have two different enzymes on both ends of the cDNA that you produce double stranded cDNA and then when you clone it into lambda gt11 vector then you can clone it into a, an orientation specific manner. So how is that done is shown here. So when you use lambda gt10 vector, then it has the choice of only one cloning site, which is equal one. So this is where the CI gene is, which needs to be disrupted in order to get the plaques and for the bacteriophage vector to undergo lytic cycle and create plaques. So uh, this is a single site cloning in lambda gt10. So this library uh, created in such a way will be a random cDNA library. And because the lambda gt10 vector does not have a promoter to drive the expression of this cDNA, there will not be any expression. Even though it's a cDNA library, you will not have the protein expression from these libraries. Now, when you use lambda gt11 or pgem vector, uh, both of these vectors are based again on lambda phage uh, uh, vector, but these have a LAC promoter and they also have LAC Z alpha fragment. So, these libraries that you create in these vectors can be uh, can have a blue white screening and selection. And uh, the MCS is also more expanded in these vectors. So because either you can do just a single site cloning in lambda GT11 on pgem vectors, this is written lambda gem, but basically it is pgem is also another nomenclature. So uh, either you can use a single site cloning again in these vectors. So you can create random libraries where only 50% of the clones will express because they will be in the correct orientation. Or you can use a directional cDNA library. So you use the adapters, two different adapters, so that you can clone them either not one, eco R1, 
or eco R1 BAMH1 or not one BAMH1 like that. So you uh, create two different sticky ends on both ends of the cDNA so that they can go only in a single orientation uh, in the genome and in the vector and therefore one can get a expression library uh, which is not random. So as I said before, if it was a random uh, cloning in both these vectors, only the probability is that only half of the clones will be expressing because the other half are more likely to be in the antisense direction. But when you do the directional cDNA cloning in these vectors, then the chances are that almost all of them can be expressed in E. coli. So then how do you screen these cDNA libraries other than the methods that I talked about in context of the genomic DNA library, the hybridization method where you can use either a DNA or an RNA probe to uh, screen the library uh, using the hybridization method or one can do the PCR based method by using gene specific primers. And the third technique which is not applicable to genomic DNA library is the use of the immunological technique. So in this the antibody based screening can be done if you already have a protein of interest and you have an antibody against that protein of interest. Then you can screen the cDNA library uh, because the proteins can be expressed from the cDNA expression library. And uh, cDNA libraries that have been made in a wide range of vectors, whether they are plasmid DNA or phage based vectors, can be screened by this method. And uh, expression libraries, which are made in lambda GT11, lambda ZAP, and plasmid vectors that have the blue white selection, can be screened by this method. And in pre genomic era, when there were all the genome sequencing and uh, all those things were not available, then this was the method of choice to find a gene for a particular protein. So, you know, biochemistry was much advanced. So most of the people used to work with proteins, they could isolate the protein and raise an antibody. And now from using that antibody, if they wanted to isolate the gene which codes for that particular protein, then this is the only method that was available at that time. So this uh, method was used to find the gene which encoded a particular protein. So now let's see how this method works. Again, similar to the genomic DNA library, you will have a number of master plates on which you plate out your cDNA library. So you will have, if you're using a plasmid, then you will have a large number of these um, clones. If you are using phage DNA, then there will be a large number of these plaques that will be uh, containing this bacteriophage, containing the cDNA and expressing this protein. So you take a nitrocellulose membrane uh, and you uh, lay it on top of your master plate and very carefully you remove this nitrocellulose membrane so that uh, there is a plaques are transferred onto the nitrocellulose, then you lyse and then you do a western blot with the antibody against the protein of interest. Now because it's an expression uh, vector in which you have cloned your cDNAs, the protein will also be made and therefore in western blotting you will get a positive signal. You can align that uh, nitrocellulose with the positive signal uh, with the master plate in order to identify which plaque had the sequence of your interest or which colony had the sequence of interest and you can pick and expand the phage in E. coli and identify the gene by sequencing. So uh, this is the way the antibody based screening is carried out uh, and so to summarize in for cDNA library, the starting material is RNA, which is converted into cDNA before cloning. In general, mRNA is used because most of the time people want to uh, study the expression of proteins 
and so which are the genes which are protein expressing uh, those are the questions that are asked using a cdna library so uh, this mrna is converted into cdna and the isolation of mrna is often carried out using oligo dt primers uh, so these libraries can be either random libraries or they can be orientation specific libraries and uh, <clears throat> lambda gt10 lambda gt11 or bgm vectors are generally used for cloning the cdna library because cdna libraries are much smaller compared to the genomic dna library and uh, the other than dna and rna hybridization and pcr methods the cdna libraries can be additionally screened by using antibody based methods um, <clears throat> if you have the antibodies available against the protein of your interest and uh, in a, if the library is randomly cloned then the probability of finding a clone is lowered by 50 percent because uh, the probability of uh, the gene uh, the cdna being cloned in the correct orientation is only 50 percent right it can either go in sense direction or anti-sense direction so 50 50 probability and uh, these are extremely useful for genome-wide expression studies and also to compare the gene expression um, at different developmental stages of an organism or in response to different signals or under different conditions and expression of different genes in different tissues of a multicellular uh, organism and uh, so the cdna libraries are extremely useful to answer genome-wide expression of the uh, genome of an organism so again uh, you can refer to these two books as i said before you can find them on the ncbi website uh, and uh, so these are the two textbooks that you can read to understand the topic that has been discussed in this lecture. You can also access this particular book called Gene Biotechnology by William Wu et al. You can Google it and the full text of uh, this chapter, especially the cDNA library, how to create them, uh, is <coughs> available. Uh, on the web so if you have access to web resources please try to find these resources to understand and revise this particular topic so this brings me to the end of this module 5 which was about the construction and screening of gene libraries Thank you for your attention.